At this point, I am extremely pleased to introduce Mr. Ramogi Huma. Mr. Huma has been an advocate for college athlete rights since he was a college athlete, where he first formed a campus student group that has developed into what is now called the National College Players Association. He has contributed extensively to the legal and legislative process over college athlete rights, giving testimony in congressional hearings to the US Department of Justice and to state legislatures and municipalities. He has served as a consultant in notable college athlete antitrust lawsuits, including O'Bannon versus NCAA and Jenkins versus NCAA, which was later merged with the Alston case before the Supreme Court today. He will offer our closing keynote, Laws and Lawsuits, The Path Toward Racial Justice, Gender Equity, and Key Athlete Protections in College Sports. Welcome, Ramogi Huma. Good morning. First, I'd like to thank the University of Washington Center for Leadership and Athletics, the Gonzaga Law School of Law, and the Knight Commission for inviting me to give today's keynote address. It's a privilege to be able to discuss important issues concerning college athletes rights and freedoms at such a pivotal time and with some of college sports future leaders. My primary message to you today is to do better than current and past college sports leaders. If the prospect of being a leader in a system that harms college athletes bothers you, that's a good sign. It means that you have a conscience. It means that you may be resistant to devastating conflicts of interest. To me, it means that you may make a great college sports leader, a leader that demonstrates that the well being of college athletes is a top priority, not through hypocritical rhetoric but through bold and continuous action. Will you help change the industry or will you let the industry change you? My hope is that today, that you will make a commitment to prioritize a fair treatment of college athletes. Current and past college sports leaders have done the opposite. As for current college sports leaders, you're on the wrong side of history, but it's never too late to do the right thing. NCAA sports is a predatory economic cartel that treats players like university property rather than people. The NCAA and his colleges do nothing about the trail of seriously injured, abused, and dead college athletes. Collectively, college sports leaders refuse to adopt NCAA rules to enforce health and safety standards to address the carnage caused by negligent and predatory athletic personnel that continues to make national headlines year after year. Most recently, a University of Michigan report found that a team doctor had sexually abused athletes for more than three decades. Michigan knew what was going on, but didn't take the appropriate measures to stop it. A similar investigation at Ohio State University revealed that sexual assaults committed by his team doctor took place over 30 years. And the abuse was known by over 50 members of the athletic staff who did not stop it. Michigan State athletes were also sexually abused by team doctor Larry Nassar. Again, university staff were aware of this, but took no action to stop it. In addition to enabling sexual predators, colleges and their staffs purposefully put their athletes in harm's way. We're not talking about just a few colleges here. It's rampant. A 2010 survey from the NCAA found that 50% of athletic trainers knowingly returned players with concussions to the same game. A 2013 National Athletic Trainers Association survey found that 50% of trainers have been pressured by coaches to do so. And, it's, and in its 2019 survey, 20% of athletic trainers report coaches playing athletes who are deemed medically ineligible to participate in athletics. This unchecked abuse is not an oversight, it's by design. While the NCAA cartel is quick to punish an athlete for receiving a few bucks for an autograph, NCAA colleges and their sport leaders have collectively decided that there are to be no NCAA rules against sexually assaulting an athlete or killing an athlete in a hazardous workout. This was highlighted in Sheely versus NCAA lawsuit brought by the mother of Derek Sheely a Frostburg State football player who died from traumatic brain injury during a football practice. The NCAA's defense is that the NCAA has no duty to protect college athletes. It's a legal position that it continues to argue. The NCAA also showed no shame, sorry about that, showed no shame in filing a legal, legal brief in support of the US Olympic and Paralympic Committee stating that the committee has no duty to protect its athletes from sexual abuse and harassment. In part, the NCAA argued such responsibility would make the NCAA responsible for actions it claims it cannot control. It's hypocritical, of course, for the NCAA to claim that it's helpless in enforcing health and safety standards while simultaneously enforcing its rules that prohibit athlete compensation. 
I'm sure many of you are wondering why colleges in the NSA enable such abuse. The answer speaks to a powerful conflict of interest. In fact, six medical associations jointly published the 2013 Teen Physician Statement that stated in part that those seeking personal gain have a conflict of interest that can put college athletes in harm's way. Universities tend to cover up abuses because they don't want their reputations harmed. They also collectively determine and say rules, which is why the NCAA won't enforce rules that will expose these abuses. Coaches, their careers and financial stability depend so heavily on winning that they're too often willing to sacrifice their athletes physical and mental health. And athletic trainers don't wanna get fired for opposing a coach's demand to play an injured athlete. I will repeat, NCAA sports is a predatory industry. That's why my organization, the NCPA, the National College Players Association, is pursuing state and federal legislation to protect college athletes' health and safety. College athletes need laws that will do five things. First, assemble experts that are independent from the colleges to identify and enforce health and safety standards. Second, require mandated reporting of suspected violations. Third, guarantee whistleblower protections. Fourth, suspend or permanently ban violators. And fifth, educate athletes about their rights so they know where to go when a violation occurs. The NCPA successfully advocated to include these protections in a California state bill and the College Athletes Bill of Rights being led by U.S. Senators Cory Booker and Richard Blumenthal in the U.S. Senate, as well as Congresswoman Jan Schakowsky in the U.S. House of Representatives. It's our hope that every college athlete in the nation will have these protections as a matter of law. Legislation allowing college athletes to have the ability to secure, secure representation and earn compensation for use of their NIL or name, image, and likeness is also needed. The issue was one of the reasons I founded the NCPA while playing football at UCLA. One of my teammates was suspended by the NCAA after groceries were left anonymously on his doorstep when he was broken hungry. And the NCAA said it was a violation because the groceries were only provided to him due to his name. Meanwhile, UCLA was selling his jersey in the student store, fully capitalizing off of his name. The fight for NIL freedoms gained momentum in 2009 when former UCLA uh, basketball player Ed O'Bannon filed an antitrust lawsuit against the NCAA for price fixing college athletes NIL compensation at zero dollars. I served as an advisor on that lawsuit and was frustrated with the ruling. Although the Ninth Circuit affirmed that the NCAA violated antitrust laws, the ruling allowed the NCAA to continue the practice of denying college athletes NIL compensation so long as it stopped capping scholarships below the cost of attendance, which is the price tag of the school. While the NCPA fought hard for years to ensure scholarships could cover the cost of attendance, this was not an acceptable remedy on NIL. Essentially, the Ninth Circuit dropped the ball, so the NCPA continued looking for ways to address it. In 2019, the NCPA co-sponsored California Senate Bill 206, the Fair Pay to Play Act. Introduced by Senators Nancy Skinner and Steve Bradford, the bill would allow California college athletes the ability to secure representation and earn money for use of their NIL. The bill received unanimous bipartisan support and was ultimately signed into law. Prior to its passage, the NCAA made public statements which amounted to threats of group boycott of California athletic programs if, F if SB 206 were to become law. Not long after, I was invited by the chief of the U.S. Department of Justice Antitrust Division, Macon Delrahim, to give a speech at one of its antitrust workshops. I detailed an array of likely NCAA antitrust violations, including the NCAA's threats of group boycott against the state of California over the Fair Pay to Play Act. I called on the US DOJ to investigate the NCAA in the same speech. Shortly afterwards, the US DOJ was in talks with the NCAA. Since those talks, the NCAA stopped making threats against California and made no threats against other states that were considering similar NIL laws. The NCPA has served as a primary supporter of NIL legislation in 12 states, and I believe it would have been more difficult to get NIL bills passed in some of these states if the NCAA continued with such illegal threats. As of today, there are 16 states that passed NIL laws to free their athletes from unjust NIL restrictions, five of which go into effect on July 1st of this year. Several other states are expected to follow suit shortly. It's not feasible for the NCAA to boycott or otherwise punish college athletes and their colleges in so many states. In fact, NCAA President Mark Emmert assured college athletes and a, state, a Florida state senator that the NCAA would not seek to punish athletes and colleges for following state laws. While NCAA punishments and boycotts are not likely, the NCAA may choose to try to delay reform in the courts. 
to help guard against this, the NCPA is encouraging states not to include language that attempts to dictate NIL terms to the NCAA. In fact, it would be best for the language not to refer to the NCAA at all. Simply stick with addressing what colleges in their state can and can't do. While, the, while NIL laws being adopted in various states should certainly pass a dormant commerce clause challenge, the NCPA recommends that states not give the NCAA an open door to try to make the case. Such NCAA challenges can slow NIL reforms and harm college athletes in those states. A number of states such as Florida and Texas are heeding the NCPA's advice. In the wake of the adoption of the California Fair Pay to Play Act, the NCAA decided to ask Congress to adopt an NCAA friendly bill that would essentially roll back most of the rights and freedoms granted by laws that were increasingly being adopted by the states. It claims that it is impossible for NCAA sports to function without uniform NIL regulations. This is also hypocritical given NCAA sports just demonstrated its ability to comply with an array of ever-changing COVID regulations on the local, state, and federal levels in pursuit of billions of dollars in TV revenue and ticket sales. If the NCAA is truly concerned that a patchwork of state laws would ruin the level playing field in college sports, the NCAA Board of Governors could adopt uniform NIL rules tomorrow that incorporate state laws. The NAIA, another large athletic association, has already done this, and 77,000 NAIA athletes already have these freedoms. The truth is that the NCAA simply wants to use Congress to eliminate athlete freedoms granted by the states, like prohibiting athlete NIL deals paid for by boosters or school sponsors. The NCAA claims competitive equity would be ruined if this were, were to be allowed. While prohibition on using NIL deals to induce a prospective athlete to attend a particular school is reasonable, prohibiting current college athletes from entering NIL deals with boosters and sponsors is not. Other sports leagues like the NFL and the NBA do not ban third-party NIL deals with fan clubs or sponsors, and those leagues operate very well. NIL arrangements with boosters, alumni, and college sports sponsors should not be banned in the name of competitive equity because competitive equity does not exist in college sports. Boosters and sponsors already give big athletic programs money to help them get the best recruits, win the most games, and score the richest TV deals, allowing them to continue their dominance. In 2019, Ohio State reported $209 million in athletic revenue, while Ohio University reported only $28 million in athletic revenue. They're both in the FBS division. Colleges, conferences, and the NCAA have not addressed these inequities. They haven't banned booster payments to colleges, and they don't share athletics revenue equally among colleges in the name of competitive equity. It's notable that in Obama versus NCAA, federal courts concluded that a level playing field does not exist under NCAA rules. Federal legislation should not sacrifice college athletes' freedoms so that NCAA sports can pretend that competitive equity exists. Additionally, roster and scholarship limits keep the inequity from getting quote unquote worse. There is a finite number of recruits each year and the top recruits already flow to the Power Five conferences. If fair legislation inadvertently changes the recruiting migrations to where some of the top recruits begin to flow away, from some of the Power Five conferences, it would actually increase competitive equity compared to where it is today. NCAA Sports takes this position because it believes that some of the commercial money that flows to schools would begin flowing to players instead. Some of that may happen, and the degree to which it does will be proof that colleges were, were using their illegal cartel power to steal money from players. The NCPA's men's basketball player protests using the not NCAA property hashtag help demonstrate college athletes' strong opposition to the notion that NCAA sports should own and monopolize the commercial value of college athletes' names. The NCPA is the primary college athletes' rights advocate in Congress, and our strategy is to generate opposition to NCAA sports efforts in seeking a bill that would roll back NIL freedoms and rights, and to use the NCAA's federal request as an opportunity to expose NCAA sports' predatory practices poor graduation rates and other unfair policies that harm college athletes. We've gained much traction in these areas, which is one of the reasons why the College Athletes Bill of Rights is so comprehensive. If congressional legislation simply ignores key problems, narrows college athletes' rights to representation, and reduces NIL freedoms being granted to athletes by their states, then it would be better for Congress not to act at all. Instead, Congress needs to address major problems that continue to fester in college sports, including better enforcement of Title IX. During the NCAA basketball tournament this year, University of Oregon women's basketball player Sedona Prince exposed the NCAA's poor treatment of the women in, the, in a video 
showing the expansive gym equipment made available to men's basketball players compared to the few dumbbells provided for women's basketball players. This rightfully ignited a firestorm of criticism against the NCAA for shortchanging female athletes compared to its treatment of male athletes. From taking less photos during women's basketball games and withholding the use of his popular March Madness logo on basketball courts to compromising women's sports funding by mismanaging and undervaluing their TV deals. These actions will increasingly have a negative economic impact on female athletes as their NIL freedoms open up. Denying women equal promotional activities reduces their potential NIL value, which reduces their potential NIL earnings. In the wake of Sedona's video, the NCPA joined her mother, Tambra Prince, and calling on the NCA to abide by and enforce Title IX. In our press release, Tambra stated that instead of enforcing rules that treat college athletes like NCAA property, the NCAA can choose to enforce Title IX to ensure that female college athletes are treated equitably in NCAA sports. The reason this isn't already happening is because NCAA sports doesn't value equal rights for women, like it values monopolizing college athletes' name, image, and likeness. While colleges that accept federal funds are subject to Title IX, the U.S. Supreme Court ruled in NCAA versus Smith that the NCAA is not. Requiring athletic associations to abide by and enforce Title IX would likely take federal legislation, which is why the NCPA is also advocating for this in Congress. Such laws might not be necessary if the U.S. Department of Education would, would do its job in this area. Currently, the Department of Education does little to enforce violations of Title IX in athletics. A 2016 article in Vice Sports helped explain that too many colleges are treating Title IX like a suggestion instead of law because the Department of Education is doing little to investigate potential violations. Generally, generally, legal enforcement requires a current athlete to sue her own school. This usually only happens when a college cuts a team and a female athlete has no other recourse to try to keep her scholarship and athletic opportunity. But do female college athletes file lawsuits when they believe their school is in violation of Title IX when they have a spot on the team and they have a scholarship? The answer is no. While doing so would help advance gender equity, it could also make them a target of retaliation. And there's been tremendous progress towards gender equity since Title IX was adopted in 1972, but there's still a ways to go. The Department of Education reports that female athletes receive only 46% of athletic scholarship money. It represent only 45% of 150,000 NCAA D1 athletes. And these stats are red flags and college sports must, must do better. Full Title IX compliance is achievable, but because athletic directors aren't held accountable, compliance becomes more of an issue of preference rather than a mandate. For this reason, the NCPA hopes to bring forth laws that would suspend athletic directors whose programs violate Title IX. The NCPA was able to help get this provision included in a California bill that it sponsored this year. The legislation is AB 609, the College Athlete Race and Gender Equity Act, and was introduced by California State Senator Sidney Cam Kamlager. Not only would AB 609 help bring forth gender equity in college athletics by holding athletic directors accountable, it would prioritize the preservation of athletic opportunities and address the economic racial injustice that exploits so many black college athletes. After the murder of George Floyd last year, we saw colleges, conferences, and the NCAA voice opposition to racial injustice in policing and in other areas, which is positive. However, NCAA sports itself is based on racial injustice. Black college athletes generate the mo most of the revenue, yet have the lowest graduation rates. In the Austin versus NCAA antitrust lawsuit that is now before the US Supreme Court, Justice Samuel Alito affirmed the legitimacy of this concern. In reference to the treatment of college athletes, he stated, so the argument is they're recruited, they're used up, and they're cast aside without even a college degree. And there is no better example of NCAA sports racial exploitation than last summer when colleges marched their football players into the COVID-19 pandemic without the enforcement of any health and safety standards in pursuit of football revenue that the players themselves would never see. The NCAA uses amateurism as cover to systematically strip generational wealth from predominantly black athletes from lower income households to pay for lavish salaries of predominantly white coaches, athletic directors, commissioners, and NCAA administrators. Last summer, I co-authored a study with Dr. Ellen Strowski, who is a professor at Ithaca College and Drexel University. The study is entitled, How the NCAA's Empire Robs Predominantly Black Athletes of Billions of Dollars in Generational Wealth. 
In our study, we applied NFL and NBA players' revenue share percentage, approximately 50%, to college football and men's basketball revenues to calculate their fair market value. Our report found that during the 2018-19 academic year, the fair market value of the average football and men's basketball player at an FBS college was $208,000 and $370,000 respectively. We found that over the course of four years after accounting for what these players receive in scholarship money, approximately $10 billion in generational wealth will have been transferred from football and basketball players, the majority of whom are black, to coaches and athletic administrators who are predominantly white. According to the NCAA's demographic data for NCAA Division I in 2018 and 19, 79% of athletic directors are white, 84% of associate athletic directors are white, and 75% of senior women administrators in athletic departments are white. This wealth transfer has, has not only cost these athletes during the years when they're playing, it compromises what could be their long-term financial security. For example, if a college football or men's basketball player invested just $100,000 of what they should be compensated for into a retirement account at 6% interest over 40 years, their investment would accrue over $1 million. Imagine a scenario where 100% of college football and basketball players have a clear path toward retirement, home ownership, and degree completion by the time they're done with their college eligibility. Instead, NCAA amateurism imposes a ser serious shift in wealth again from predominantly black athletes to white coaches and athletic administrators. Many may agree that college athletes deserve a fair portion of the revenue they generate, but worry that NCAA arguments opposing compensation are valid. So I'll, ble I'll briefly address why NCAA's arguments are not valid. NCAA sports three primary arguments against college athlete compensation are first, the NCAA says competitive equity would be ruined. I've already detailed why competitive equity doesn't exist. Additionally, the NCPA is advocating for a revenue sharing arrangement where athletes within each sport receive an equal payment. The notion of competitive equity just doesn't hold water in this debate. Second, the NCAA says paying college athletes will destroy amateurism. In short, amateurism serves as a tool of racial injustice. No one understood better what amateurism meant to the business of college sports than Walter Byers, who was the first full-time executive director of the NCAA. Of the NCAA. In his book entitled Unsportsmanlike Conduct, Exploiting College Athletes, Byers wrote that amateurism was modern day misnomer for economic tyranny. He said amateurism was a device to divert money away from the players and wrote that collegiate amateurism is not a moral issue, it's economic camouflage for monopoly practice. During the Supreme Court hearing in Austin versus NCA, Justice Clar Clarence Thomas stated, it strikes me as odd that coaches' salaries have ballooned and they are in the amateur ranks, as are the players. The exploitative and hypocritical nature of the NCAA's professed function and virtue of amateurism cannot be defended on any level. Third, the NCAA claims that paying college athletes fair market value would require cutting sports. This argument is baseless. baseless. If big football and basketball revenues were needed for other sports to exist, then NCAA Division II wouldn't exist, but Division II does exist over 300 schools where there are not enough football or basketball revenue to subsidize other sports. NCAA Division III, the NAIA and community college athletics wouldn't exist either, but they do exist. They simply don't spend extravagantly like Division I sports. Dr. Ellen Strowski and I conducted an analysis finding that in 2017, the average Division I FBS college spent about $34 million per year more than the average Division I FCS college to field the same sports. This means that the FBS expenditure levels are not necessary to field Division I sports. In fact, while FBS revenues exploded by over $5 billion between 2003 and 2018, the number of athletes decreased by over 300, while the number of assistant coaches increased by over 1,500. Administrative expenses skyrocketed by over a billion dollars. It's clearly unnecessary to hire more coaches and administrators for fewer athletes. A source of my confusion over the years has been about how opposition to paying college athletes persists while NCAA arguments against it are so clearly misguided. Part of the answer was revealed in a 2017 study entitled Prejudice or Principle Conservatism, Racial Resentment and, the, and White Opinion Toward Paying College Athletes. 
The study found that the primary driver of our opposition to compensating college athletes among white people is racial resentment against African-Americans. The racial resentment was described in the study as more of a subconscious bias rather than an overt racist position. But this explains why some people seem to ignore the facts and tolerate a double standard when comparing lavish salaries among white coaches and, and administrators to scholarship checks that leave most college athletes below the federal poverty line. Factor in the fact that of the college chancellors and presidents who ultimately dictate NCAA rules, 80% of them are white. While this topic may be uncomfortable for some to hear, it's important to discuss so that people have a better opportunity to overcome their own racial biases and focus on an equitable arrangement for college athletes. In 2014, I became an advisor supporting plaintiffs in Jenkins versus the NCAA antitrust lawsuit targeting the NCAA's cap on college athlete compensation. The case was soon combined with a similar antitrust lawsuit, Austin versus NCAA. The NCAA settled the damages case for $209 million in 2017. And in 2019, a federal court ruled and the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals upheld a decision in favor of the plaintiffs. As relief, the ruling eliminated a prohibition on educational related compensation paid to college athletes of up to approximately $5,600 per athlete per year. Both sides appealed the ruling and the US Supreme Court recently heard the case in March. As to my earlier point about the exploitative nature of the NCAA's version of amateurism, it was refreshing to hear US Supreme Court Justice uh, Brett Kavanaugh state during the hearing that antitrust law should not be a cover for the exploitation of college athletes. <clears throat> and while I'm hopeful that plaintiffs in Austin prevail, the remedy of educational related compensation of up to $5,600 per year falls woefully short of economic justice. The failure of the, judici the judicial system in Obama versus N NCAA is why the NCPA co-sponsored the California Fair Pay to Play Act on NIL. And it's clear that the judicial system will not provide a fair remedy for college athletes in Austin versus NCAA. This is a primary reason the NCPA sponsored California AB 609, the California College Athlete Race and Gender Equity Act. If signed into law, not only would it be the first state law in the nation that enforces Title IX and preserves all sports, it would ensure all college athletes in the state receive their fair market value. Paying fair market value to athletes in California under AB 609 would only cost affected Division I California colleges an average of 8% of revenue. It's definitely doable. It's notable that athletes in the only predominantly black sports in California, FBS football and Division I men and women's basketball, are the only athletes who receive less than 50% of their sports revenue. And this underscores the racial injustice in NCAA sports, which was a primary driver of the NCPA's collaboration with hundreds of Pac-12 football players who demanded their fair share of revenue during the We Are United player protests last summer. My hope is that California AB 609 will inspire other states to adopt similar laws to bring forth better Title IX enforcement and ensure that all college athletes receive their fair market value while preserving all sports just as our California NIL law has done. So I'll end this keynote the same way I began, by asking current and future college sports leaders to do the right thing. Make a commitment to overcome the conflicts of interest that harm college athletes. Be the college sports leaders who finally stand up and, do, and does the right thing. Make sure your legacy is one that you can be proud of. Generations of college athletes need your help. Thank you. Thank you, Ramogi, for sharing your perspectives on college sports as we embark on a short-term future that will set the path for the future well beyond this current moment in college sports. We are grateful to you and all of the panelists and moderators over the last two days for sharing their perspectives on the future of college sports. For closing our conference, I am very happy to welcome Ms. Amy Perko, Chief Executive Officer of the Knight Commission on Intercollegiate Athletics. Welcome, Amy. Thank you. And thanks uh, on behalf of the Knight Commission to all the speakers and panelists in this program for sharing their expertise and insights during this pivotal year in college sports. Over the past year, the commission has released its most comprehensive set of recommendations for the future of college sports, beginning with principles to guide NIL rules released in April of 2020. And those principles have proven as hoped to be influential. 
In October and December, we released recommendations to further transform the NCA Division I model through changes to the NCA's revenue distribution and to its governance and structure. Finally, two weeks ago, we released a new report with recommendations to achieve racial equity in college sports. I recommend all those reports to you and they're available on our website, knightcommission.org. And you can also follow us on Twitter at, at Knight Athletics. The Knight Commission has never pretended to have all of the answers. In forums like this, for thought leaders to have an open exchange of ideas and discuss the most challenging issues facing college sports are critical to progress. So a special thanks to the organizers at Gonzaga University School of Law and the University of Washington Center for Leadership in Athletics. Thank you all for your participation. Thank you, Amy. And thank you to the Knight Commission for the support and encouragement of this forum. Last, I'm happy to introduce Dr. Jeff Gilden, Assistant Vice President for Academic Advancement at Gonzaga University, who has a few closing acknowledgements and announcements. Thanks, Dr. Hoffman. Uh, first, I want to thank everyone for attending our conference these uh, past two days. What a great group of panelists and moderators. Uh, the expertise and experience in these sessions has really been unrivaled. We appreciate everyone taking the time. You know, what did I take away? As someone who spent better part of a decade studying leadership, this issue, I wrote a ridiculously long dissertation about it, is, uh, this is extremely complicated and there are no easy answers. Uh, we have, uh, the takeaway is simple. There's much unknown and uncertainty, but it is long past time for, for our leaders to lean in and lead. Um, we've been behind this for too long. So versus relying on litigation, politicians and the courts to make a decision, let's hope this next year we'll be able to lean in and, and get some clarification from the court, but also from our leaders to take us in a clear sense and a new direction. As we close, I wanna let everyone know who attended, we'll be sending an email in the next day or so with a short survey that we would graciously ask you to complete to help us know how this conference landed and how we can continue to refine this type of event. Uh, Gonzaga and University of Washington plan to continue this work into the future and we will further build this partnership so you can expect additional programming, especially as we evaluate the pending Supreme Court decision, its impact and other updates and certain movement in the coming year. In the email that we will have, this, the, the, that we'll have the survey link, we will also make sure to share with you the recording where this recording can be accessed. Many of you have asked about that. Finally, I wanna express a sincere thank you to all of those who worked this past, it's really been about a year and a half, almost two years since we started this conversation. Uh, Jacob Brooksby, our Dean of our law school, Dr. Jen Hoffman, uh, become valuable friends, but be, and uh, Professor McPeak from Gonzaga Law School. But I also wanna thank those behind the scenes who often don't get the credit, specifically Bryn Borman, from Gonzaga Law School, Chantel Cosner, Stephanie Bredoya from UW, Brooke Flatten and Sky Johnson from all, also from University of Washington for their tremendous support in helping with research and all event logistics. A special thank you to our academic colleagues who contributed, Deans Rosemary Hunter of the School of Leadership Studies at Gonzaga, Dean Yoli Giardo of the School of Education, and of course, Ed Taylor, Vice Provost at University of Washington. Once again, thank you all for participating and may everyone find peace and health as we come out of this pandemic, hopefully, and prepare for, for brighter days going forward. Thank you and have a wonderful day.